everybody, and welcome to the Comic Con 2021 panel for the Legacy of Del Close, creator of DC Comics Wasteland. Um, today, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, the movie for Mad Men Only, which uh, explores the weird mind of Del Close and his contributions to comedy through the lens of a comic book called Wasteland that he co wrote with uh, John Ostrander, who's with us, and Mike Gold, who was the editor, and I, I believe the man who had the idea to begin with. Um, so to honor this, there's DC Comics is re-releasing the comic book Wasteland for the first time since the late 80s uh, in, uh, to correspond with the release of the film this summer in July. So um, to honor this historic moment, we're bringing together the real life co-creators of Wasteland and the actors who played some of them uh, in the film for Mad Men only, plus the director of the film, Heather Ross. Uh, my name is Adam Goldman. I, I co-wrote the film with Heather, and uh, I'm the guy who got stuck with this job. It's going to be fun. Here we go. Okay, so. <laughs> um, for people who don't know, comedy guru Del Close, uh, he mentored everybody uh, in fr starting from, uh, he worked with comedy greats like Elaine May way back in the day and then taught at Second City and everyone you know from Saturday Night Live and from comedy from John Belushi through B Bill Murray through Chris Farley uh, through the UCB4, uh, one of whom we have with us today and uh, all the way through Tina Fey and Amy Poehler. So he's one of those names that uh, insiders know, but considering the impact he's had on entertainment, very few people know that there's a there's one guy sort of behind all this stuff um and so heather set out to tell dell's story uh in a documentary and the way dell tells his own story in in life uh was through an amazing collection of anecdotes that were sometimes fantastical sometimes weirdly true despite how unbelievable they sounded um and it sort of made sense somehow that this man would write his autobiography in a sort of psychological horror comedy comic book for DC Comics, um, and that's Wasteland. And uh, the film looks at Dell's story through the writing of the comic book. Uh, that's one of the modes. So we're gonna right now look at a clip uh, from the film with, uh, with uh, Matt, you're in this, and so is James Urbaniak. Uh, and then we have um, John, of course, is being played by uh, actor Josh Fadum, who's not with us today. Uh, so we're going to watch what we imagined a writing session was like. Um, <laughs> so here we go. Based on interviews. So, of course, I'm going to ask you guys how badly we blew it, but we're going to watch <laughs> it first. All right, here we go. Uh, nickel, dimed, and quartered. Oh. <laughs> Ooh, Maton with Satan. No, the cream and demon. Which one? Uh, cream and demon. Cream and demon. Uh, what am I looking at? Is maybe what you're asking yourself right now? Well, Doug Close has just been hired to write a comic book about his life. For DC Comics, no less. Uh, emergency room service? No, no. Emergency rumors. 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 Great minds. And this is his team. Smell of the mega brain. Here's Del, full of ideas. Sniff and crawl. Only problem is, they're all back. <laughs> That's Mike Gold, Dell's editor, trying to figure out how to turn bad into comic books. Well, he was insane. Uh, now, I like that. <laughs> insane people come up with great stories. They, they go places nobody's ever been before. What happened to Merlin? Beat us. The fetus. Here's John Ostrander, Dell's trusty writing partner. He's just happy to be in the room, even if it smells like an ashtray full of farts. Many times I go, how did Dell and I ever work together? Dell is hip. I'm a square. I'm so square, I'm almost cube. But I knew comics, and he was Dell. You know, he had this imagination. Probably yeah. there's androids. Probably. <laughs> Probably there's androids. You know what? Oh, and all Dell's lines here are direct quotes taken from tape recordings he made throughout his life. Anyway, back to 1987. Which is in Toronto. 
I love that. Okay. Toronto freaks me out. Right? That is great. Can I get an outline on that? Which yeah. is in Toronto yeah, Thursday? You, you bet. Beautiful. Did you write Good. that? I got it. Which is in, Toronto. is in Toronto. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cute, huh? Um, so before we dive in, I want to do real introductions for everybody. So of course, um, we have Heather Ross, the director and uh, co-writer of the film that we just saw a clip from for Mad Men Only. Uh, if we're going to go Brady Bunch style, um, right below her is James Urbaniak, actor and writer known for um, his work with Hal Hartley, which I'm a big fan of, uh, his work as Dr. Venture on the Venture Brothers. Um, recently, also a very popular show called uh, For All Mankind, I believe on Apple, and uh, Difficult People, uh, tons, tons of great stuff. And experimental theater from New York City way back in the day. Quite a bit of that back in the day. <laughs> Below him is Mike Gold, a 45-year veteran of the comic book industry, um, served as group editor and director of editorial development for DC, uh, founder and editorial director of First Comics, um, some pretty pretty far out stuff on First Comics, and uh, publisher of Classics Illustrated. I believe there's something to do with psychology in there somehow, but we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> To Mike Gold's right is John Ostrander, uh, writer of comic books. Uh, so he uh, made his DC Comics debut by plotting the miniseries Legends, uh, also known for, I believe, creating Suicide Squad uh, before moving on to Wasteland, the collaboration with Del Close that we'll be discussing today. Um, and you had worked together with Del on Munden's Bar, a part of uh, kind of the back of uh, Grimjack for first, I believe. We'll get into that as well. And then above John is Matt Walsh, uh, of course, an actor, comedian, movie director, and screenwriter, uh, known for, for being a founding member of the Upright Citizens Brigade, which has a sort of direct link to Dell and his teachings back in Chicago. Um, Matt, you will also know from uh, the HBO series Veep. Uh, in our film, he plays Mike Gold. Can I address the elephant in the room? How yeah. did I do? What about me? No, Mike. I portrayed oh, yeah. you. What do you I mean, what do you think? <laughs> did I capture your spirit? I, I, Matt, I think you have too much hair. Oh, <laughs> God bless you. But, for, but first you're, of you're, all, God bless you for saying that. <laughs> uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, Toronto is a bizarre place. <laughs> but, Otherwise, I, I think you did. I think you did great. Uh, Thank you. Know, you. I don't. I'm not sure that the three of us were ever in the same room together working on Wasteland. We oh. did on Munden's Bar, if I recall correctly, but that was ten thousand years ago, and I can't recall what I had for breakfast. So it, it was that. I wish we had that sort of give and take. But with Dell in the room, I would have been totally intimidated. <laughs> which is the proper response for meeting Dell. Well, let's back up a tiny bit. Uh, so, uh, John, you had known Dell prior to working on Wasteland. How did you how did you meet Dell? Well, I knew of Dell um, because I was in Chicago theater. You couldn't be in Chicago theater and not know of Dell. Um, we were in uh, Christmas Carol uh, uh, together at the Goodman Theater. Uh, from its very first year. And uh, we were assigned dressing rooms and I wound up in a dressing room with Dell. And as I say in the film, I'm so straight, um, straight I'm cubed, you know. Uh, and so I was a little afraid, I was intimidated. But I found out that very genial guys, the only problem I had was uh, the constant smoking. Uh, but I also discovered that he was so knowledgeable about science fiction. He loved comics. So we had a lot of great conversations. And actually the way that I sold Munden's Bar to Mike, who was the editor at the time of Grimjack, I, I suggested it as an anthology series, you know, set in the bar where Grimjack works out of. And Mike went, no, no, anthology series never works. It's always too complicated. You got to get new people in all the time. And so he gave me a flat no on that until I said, I think I can get Del Close to write it with me. Boom, we're off to the races. <laughs> so you, were you intimidated by him a little bit at the beginning? Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, you know, I mean, you hear all these stories about Dell, you know, uh, he's going to get you high. He's going to introduce you to satanic uh, 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 verses, you know, it's, uh, uh, yeah, sure. You know, like, uh, also, you know, like in any room, he was going to be the most brilliant guy in the room, you know, so uh, intimidated. Yeah, sure. You bet. <laughs> Um, so Heather, to go to you for a second, just to kind of bring it back to the film. Um, so Dell is mainly known as this kind of godfather of long form improv and, and improv in general and comedy guru. So, you know, what made, what drew you to Wasteland, the comic book as part of the film that you were making about him? You might be on mute though. On mute. There you go. Um, might have been better the other way, but um, <laughs> no, I came to Dell completely as a comedy fan and as a interest in him as a psychological specimen. And uh, you know, we as we got into it, we were thinking, you know, this is great, but there's so little material of Dell because he worked in improv, which is necessarily something that kind of evaporates after you perform it. He wasn't a big star like so many of the people that he mentored or taught. Um, so there just wasn't a record. There really wasn't a record. So we're like, well, shoot, what do we put on the screen? And I had a very talented writer that was working with me that was sort of a comics head and said, well, you know, there's this comic book. And um, <laughs> we uh, started looking at it. And it was kind of perfect because there are these autobiographical stories that he's written that are clearly, I don't want to say clearly um, fantastical because always the, the weirdest ones end up being the truest ones, but um, it just seemed like a great way to come at his sort of inner life, at looking at the way he told his story and what these stories meant to him. So we use that as sort of the, the spine of the film. Um, so that brings me to, to Matt. You you started working with Dell, I think, uh, in the late 80s, which if, I, if my math is right, it's sort of right after Wasteland happened. Like, were you, was this something that you were aware of? Um, no. I, and Yeah. Well, go ahead, finish your question. That's well, bad. but And if not, I imagine that you were aware of his stories or is, is, I guess, yeah. A, were you aware of Wasteland, the comic book? And B, you know, as a student of his, maybe you can tell us about how you, how you came to take his class and the role that his storytelling played in the way he taught. Uh, I unfortunately didn't know of Wasteland uh, when I entered into uh, Dell's like teaching world at Improv Olympic, which was at a restaurant called Chow, I believe. They were constantly floating to different locations and of Dell, like he was very intimidating, which I'm so glad you guys who were, his, who were his peers felt the same intimidation, by the way. I just, I was frightened of that guy for a couple of years and I was in the classroom with him for a couple of years and I don't think I ever got over that intimidation. Um, but he, uh, I did know of Dell, that is very true. Like his legend was in the comedy scene and I was curious about improv and I'd taken a little and then Dell was sort of, in my memory was returning from LA after a stint in LA after trying to do acting again. So the, the sort of buzz was like Dell's back in town. And so Dell having touched so many careers and uh, being like a, a second city director and being like this long form genius, which is what I was just getting turned on to. I had studied what we call short form, which is akin to whose line is it where you know the rules and you sort of you play rewind or you play like do it now as Woody Allen like they very structured improv and Dell was obviously for him uh, espousing long form so he was every bit of the legend that anybody who cared about long form improvisation was about so yes the stories were swirling about uh, in our little comedy community about Dell. Everybody was intimidated by Dell. Yeah, uh, I mean that was just stock and trade. You start working with Dell or, or knowing Dell or even living on the same block as Dell, and all of a sudden you find yourself in this world of people, big name, gifted, remarkably talented people, not just on stage, but in real life. And everybody 
has the same feeling. We know the same stories about Dell and we're all intimidated. And I think that proves that at least we're somewhat healthy. <laughs> Good. Good. I feel better. <laughs> so, J James, I, I imagine you, I don't know, have, have you met Dell? I just wonder if oh. you're mentally sound since you're the person who actually had to portray him. Are you, have you recovered from that? How was that experience of trying to get into this guy's mind? Oh, I loved it. I mean, Heather got in touch with me. We didn't know each other. But the funny thing is, I, I don't, ha I'm an actor, but I don't have an improv background. I don't have that training. But I've been a lifelong student of like American show business in all its facets. And when I was young, like started getting interested in acting, like college age or early 20s, I became very interested in the history of improv and Second City and the compass. And I like read about that. And, and at one point when I was very young, like in college, I thought, oh, maybe I could go to Chicago and go to Second City, but I grew up in New Jersey. So I just ended up going to New York and becoming an actor. But so he was someone I'd been aware of for decades. Uh, and I'd read, I think I'd, I'd read Howard Johnson's biography already. Like I, I was pretty familiar with him. So that was just a coincidence. Heather didn't know that I was interested. By the way, with my quarantine beard, I look more like him <laughs> in his later period. I'm sorry I didn't and have that when we shot him. I, I By the way, you're great. I just wonderful. want to say you're so good as Dell. I just want to say that. The, movie, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. the movie's great. Absolutely. Oh, that um, means a lot. Great. You well, are you're great. Heather gave me a, I mean, I, I already knew, uh, you know, a bit about him, but then Heather had some great material like these audio of the interviews he did with Janet Coleman, who's a writer who wrote a great book about the compass, which is the pre Second City improv company. And he goes off on, in those. And of course, all the dialogue is stuff, a lot of the dialogue is stuff from those interviews. Right. So there was a lot of good material to look at and other interviews that, that I, you know, I hadn't seen before. There's only so much online, actually. Right. But yeah, and, and you know, I, 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 I feel like I was a good fit for his kind of energy <laughs> and that kind of quasi pompous voice he had. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because you didn't do an impersonation of him. Like you didn't do the dull closed voice. It is, you know, an Im more impressionistic, but seems totally yeah. cool to me. I, but obviously Mike and- It's like an idea and, of Dale Close. <laughs> so Mike, um, knowing that everyone was intimidated by this guy and he was crazy and it also sounds like he wasn't always 100% reliable. Where did this idea come from to make a comic book with him? And why? Oh, geez. First of all, I have to point out that of, of the six of us, John does an amazing impression of Dell's voice. Come on, John. Amazing. He could, yeah, he could do right. Dell oh, and, and just frighten it. the hell out of you. Uh, we were doing London's Bar, and, and it was the greatest fun that I had as an editor, um, because I was also editor-in-chief, and I can get away with anything. Uh, so we enjoyed it so much that when we were looking for some work, I had moved to New York. Uh, I, DC made me a wonderful offer, uh, which they actually held to for six of my seven years. And... Um, I brought John along. John was involved in my very first project for, for DC because John's really gifted. And we were looking for something a little strange to do. We took this like long walk around this pond out in Connecticut uh, in the rain. And by the time we were back in my, my place, we had wasteland, you know, it, it was done, I think, in the spirit of Dell's bizarreness, which I have to point out, John and I are perfectly capable of, of meeting halfway, but nobody in the world has ever been capable of meeting Dell all the way. Hmm. It can't, it couldn't be done. Just, just could not be done. And he knew it. So that was the difficulty. Yeah, he wasn't the most reliable guy, but John was still living in Chicago at that time, or most of that time at least. And, and he was the guy who had to put up with working with Dell and finding Dell at the same place at the same time. So um, 
that was uh, he did that defensively because he knows how I define the word deadline. <laughs> the word deadline starts with the word dead. You know, so. <laughs> So was this a hard sell to DC? Like this was uh, what struck me when I found out about Wasteland was that uh, DC was not in the business in the late '80s of doing autobiographical horror comic books with like little-known comedy cult gurus. You know, uh, how did you sell this to DC? And John, you know, maybe you can pipe in on this too. I sold to DC by. Um telling my boss, who's Dick Giordano, the, the editor-in-chief there at the time, uh, who has a, had a wonderful sense of humor and a great sense of bizarreness, that we would be publishing something very, very risky, very, very on edge, probably wouldn't last more than 12 issues, but everybody would know about it. Everybody would know about it. And he liked that. And it was his job to tell that to our publisher, who was a friend of mine anyway, Jeanette Kahn. And um, Jeanette, you know, oh, Del Close, I know about him. Great. So she greenlit it. And in the very first issue, when she, she read it, uh, we did this story called RAB, which was retroactive abortion, where we decided that it was OK to like abort a child who's like eight years old. and it offended her so greatly that she never read another issue, which I perceived as a green light to do anything. And each issue, we just sort of up the ante a little bit more. John and I would, would sort of talk about it uh, every month, you know, in order to prop up the, the, that bar a little bit more. And uh, John was perfectly up to the task. Dell, of course, rolled out of bed being up, up to that task. Um, but I, after a while, I began to realize that it took John uh, with Dell as long to write an eight-page, nine-page story as it did to, for him to write a full book. And comics in those days, to a certain extent still, pay by the page. Ah. So John was slowly starving to death while doing some of the greatest work the medium has ever seen. And then well, he, had to split, he had to split it with Dell. <laughs> so John, uh, it sounds like this was a, uh, a project with unique uh, challenges. Could you, what were some of the ups, the ups and downs of, of this particular project and this collaborator, you know, in particular? Well, so having worked with Dell already on London's Bar, uh, I was used to some of the quirks that might come with it. Um, part of my job on Wasteland was when Dell couldn't be found or stuff, well, there's still deadlines to be fitted. Mike once called me up and told me I'd moved past deadline and was heading towards funeral line. <laughs> and um, my job was to make sure that the requisite number of, of stories were ready somewhere around deadline, between deadline and funeral line. So sometimes I would plunge ahead without Dell. And even working with Dell, it could take any kind of different form. He might come in um, with yellow legal pad things with the story written out. Uh, not a, uh, it was my job to arrange it into pages and panels you know, uh, to, to fit the format. So on that, I was, not so much uh, uh, input, but then Dell would come in with an idea and we would talk about it and develop it. And then it would be my idea to set it down in words. Sometimes he would give me two or three lines. Boom, that was it. Okay, I'll take it and go from there. You know, what does that mean? So uh, my job was to be whatever the book required and whatever Dell required for me to be. Um, I, I think a good example of Dell and my working together, and one, actually it's a story that, uh, um, very personal to me too, that I love. We were up working at a coffee shop and Dell was looking a little bothered and um, he stops uh, before we begin, he goes, before we, we begin, I, I gotta warn you about me. Um, I had a partner before and well, you just need to be warned. 
And I, I nodded. And he was sincere about it. He wasn't trying to intimidate. He wasn't trying to do anything. He, uh, he was being sincere. And so I said, right. okay, I'm warned. Can we get? Can we go on with the work? And he went, okay. And <laughs> went on with the work. And um, that, a lot of, I think there's a lot of Dell right there. You know, however crazed and as he was and everything else, but there was this human being underneath it all. And that comes through in his stories. Uh, um, some of his autobiographies like Dell and Elrond, uh, which ends with um, keep, keep walking mother bear, you know, it's, he did reveal himself in it and not just right. in terms of being uh, this mad genius. Which well. uh, so Matt, um, you've heard John Ostrander's um, Del Close in person. What would you, what, how would you rank it? <laughs> uh, lovely. I thought it was perfect. And um, I guess I would ask, did you guys succumb to like weed abuse? Not that it would color any of your work being <laughs> around someone like that. And secondly, why do you think he, because my guess is he respected you guys or he was still Del, but it seems like you two have bonded with him. What do you have any insight into that? Well, first of all, I came pre-succumbed. Okay. So uh, that that wasn't particularly an issue. Okay. Um, okay. Although I never had the depth of Dell's uh, drug taking experiences, um, we had a certain shared framework there. Um, <laughs> Dell is a force of nature. And either you accept it and you work with it, which is improv training, really, you know, you go with it, um, or you get the hell out of the way and do something else. So, I mean, totally something else. Um, it was, it was a, a wonderful experience. Uh, Del and I became very close. I'd met him a few times beforehand at different parties. I was on radio in Chicago for a long time and I had a lot of Second City people doing commercials for me. Oh my God, I think God just discovered me. Right, that's my wife. Why? And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> hello. and uh, it, it, it was just, it was sort of, after you're done working every every session, you, you sort of realize that, that it's like a, a privilege to have worked with a man that insanely brilliant. Yeah. And every time I would just sit around and talk with him, I was at his 60th birthday party and that was just wonderful. And, and then, you know, a bunch of people would just sit around like we're just sitting around right now sharing stories and nobody ever topped them and I only saw one or two people try and god he eviscerated them just by flicking his finger it was like Thanos at the end of of the first Avengers movie it was just snap and half the world is dead <laughs> it was beautiful uh, beautiful so I just want to go to, uh, back to Heather for a second. So we're hearing a lot about the, cr the creative process um, and the mess of making the comic book. Uh, and I know, you know, while directing, what you were drawn to was this idea that Dell took the, or personified the creative process in all of its kind of glory and all of its messiness. So could, could you talk about that a little bit and how the film kind of tries to sh portray that? Yeah, I mean, we worked on this film. It was, it took years of making connections with people and finding people and finding all this material that was so buried in people's garages and, you know, filing cabinets. And, um, you know, time passes and comedy changes and you change. So, you know, I find, found myself, you know, when we were getting really into edit, asking, like, well, what is my point of connection to this man who, like, I, I have no idea like if we would have been friends. I don't, I think I would have been like Matt, I would have been freaking terrified. So I, um, you know, to me, you know, there were so many ways to like skin the cat of Del Close and like he probably did skin cats is the other part <laughs> of that. But um, you have to like 
find your point of connection because there there are many faces there. And and for me, it was you know that this sort of like lifelong struggle of the create with the creative process, and that he sort of epitomizes that like the highs of it, you know, that where you're so giddy and you've like invent, you know, he invented a new art form. You know, most of us are lucky if we like invent like something that someone likes, you know, he invented a whole freaking art form genre. And it was painful. It was a painful process. You see it take its toll over the years as he's trying to make this thing work. And as a documentarian who, who's films often take years and involve a lot of struggle. That was my point of connection. And, you know, through him and through Wasteland and how, you know, there, it, it, it shows you how to come at things in, in a different way. You know, like you don't just sit down and like come up with the idea that like part of it is, you know, maybe you might need to go learn calculus or maybe you learned, you know, like I think from Matt, I, I learned that he really is really always trying to get people to learn and be, interested in the world in different parts of the world not just comedy so um you know i sort of took him as the sort of personification of that creative spirit that runs you ragged but it's such a fun ride so uh matt when you were training with him well i i have a question that involves the herald it's hard to talk about and i know that we don't have the time to do it uh but it's a for people who don't know, it's a kind of uh, long form improv that I believe that Dell took 30 years to sort of perfect. Um, is, is that what you were training with him on? Yeah, we, uh, that was sort of the compulsory exercise to uh, get on stage over there. You, you would have to do heralds and then you would get put on teams at the Improv Olympic, but he was always, if you'd gone through those classes and you were taking more classes, you were always working on new forms because his journey was like, oh, these video games, I, you know, I see all these, let, let's do something with the, uh, where we're inside the video game. Now get up there and don't know where it's going. This is my impression, John. Uh, <laughs> and so his hunger, like, like Heather was saying, is hunger to learn more or to make the art form relevant. Like you guys are carrying the art form, get up there and you know, do something relevant, explore this art form, you know? And so that was what I took away from him. And that's where I sort of entered into beyond the Herald, the Dell world. And then you later employed Dell when, when um, Upright Citizens Brigade had a, a show on Comedy Central. Yeah, he was the voice of our, uh, he was probably the benefactor or he would almost like Charlie from Charlie's Angels, he would, uh, do the intro of the show and uh, talk about the group. And he really loved that. And he even gave us a nice kudos at his living funeral, uh, which he mentioned love, which was so sweet, like, you know, spreading love, which is very undell like He was always surprising in that way. He, his takeaway about improv was like, you're, you're basically spreading love. And that's not such a bad thing in this world. And like, who said that? What guy is that? Do you know what I mean? I don't know. John. It might have been this. It might have been the uh, the painkillers. Um, Maybe so, or the human side that John talked about that we yeah they see. Yeah, uh, I I should point out that um, while we were doing Wasteland, I also got married, uh, and my fiance, then later wife Kim Yale, was scared to death to meet Dell, but he couldn't have been nicer to her, and because he was my writing partner, I said, well, okay. I've got to invite him to the wedding and the reception, not knowing what he would do. Um, I thought he was fully capable in the receiving line of going up to my mother and saying, we're all so glad John's married. Now the uh, animals at Lincoln Park are much less nervous. Sharon, <laughs> uh, by the way, agreed to me, he could have done that, but he did, <laughs> he couldn't have been he was very, he was nice to my mother. He was nice actually to everyone. He, he was just happy to be there. He was happy to have been invited. And uh, we were writing partners. Yeah. Uh, James, so uh, you mentioned earlier that you had access to hours and hours of recordings of, um, of Dell's classes. Uh, well, not classes, uh, interviews he did with Janet Coleman. Ah, right, right. And right. then there were I, I, there was a little bit of video and maybe some audio of some classes, but the bulk of it, if, if I recall, 
right. those interviews, but he goes on at length in those interviews about his history and stuff. What in particular, um, like what resonated with you that you brought into the performance? Because like I said, it's not an impersonation. Uh, it is something that kind of evokes Dell in, in a more artful way. So I'm just wondering what you took from those, those interviews in particular. I think I'm just kind of struck and inspired by his sort of, I think I used this word before in another interview, but he was a seeker and he had a vision and he was a really committed artist to what he was doing. And he continued to try to push forward with that throughout his entire life, which is quite inspiring, especially now that I'm of a certain age. <laughs> You know, I, my impression is he didn't coast. He never coasted. Yeah. Uh, there were other issues, interpersonal issues, and sort of just living in the world issues that seemed to come up. And that that's sort of part and parcel with someone who's that focused, you know. So I just found that rather inspiring. So it was, and that's sort of a key to who that character was to me. It's just this this guy who just keeps seeking. But he's also a storyteller and a raconteur and a, obviously a big self mythologizer so that so i guess the key is he's he he's he is a, he's also a performer from the ground up yeah. so there's just a lot of fun levels there to play with if you're playing yeah. an idea of him you know it's a character with his name based on ideas that he threw out there <laughs> very similar to my mike gold homework <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Mike and John, uh, something both of you mentioned it when, when we spoke to you, when Heather interviewed you for the film, uh, that you, to this day, people, it's not a, it's not a well-known title, Wasteland, and maybe this reissue will change that, but it is a title that has garnered tons of respect and admiration. And you both mentioned that this was something that hadn't been done in comics before. Um, so, but what is the, what is the that in that sense? Like what, what hadn't been done before that you guys, you guys did? Cause I agree. I just want to hear as from the people who did it. Idea of horror is to take you through something that scares you, but then in general drops you off safely on the other side. Right. We didn't do that. We took you into the center of it and we left you there. Right. Uh, uh, and. Uh, sometimes with a chuckle. I mean, Mike has also described Wasteland as uh, having black hole humor, uh, humor that's so so dark, uh, no laughs can escape from it. But uh, that, uh, what we were doing was uh, taking the, the general idea of the horror anthology, which had been around for a while and had a lot of great practitioners in it, but it was sort of locked into its own thing and we took it and sort of said no we're not doing it quite that way and there was no one better to find <laughs> the way to do it differently than Dell. And there was a, oh, yeah, yeah. some very controversial hate mail. I, I believe there's a scene that that Matt's in uh, well obviously and James uh, involving reading a very real hate, hate mail letter that was printed in the uh, in the column in the letters column. Uh, so yeah, Mike, maybe you could talk about the hate mail a little bit, but also just the push and pull with the company or just fans in general. Well, when I composed our letter columns, I was not picking letters that were reflective of the overall reaction from our readership. I would pick the most interesting letters, something with something to say uh, at, under the best circumstances. And, you know, that means that the weirdos are, are going to have an in on that piece. And the more extreme stuff is, is the stuff that's going to get printed, um, as long as it's just not stupid ranting. Uh, we try to minimize that. But uh, we didn't get that much hate mail. We would, we got a lot of admiration from our our peers, particularly at conventions, and to this day that still happens. And I can't, I'm not speaking for John here or ever, but 
you know, we still sign thousands of copies of those of, of Wasteland at, at every convention we go to. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it obviously it, it, it made an impression on somebody. And, um, and, you know, I'm really proud of that. We didn't get that much hostility. We, I never felt like we should probably now hire a guard. That, is, that happened with other projects of mine, but very rarely in comics. I want to add one thing to what John said, though, and I think, it's, I, think, I think this is important, even though it's retroactive. What we did in Wasteland was sort of a continuation of what Monty Python did to humor. They would tell their story, and when the story was done, they stopped. They didn't do any sort of artificial ending. It didn't meander into some sort of safe feel good thing and I think unconsciously perhaps maybe not that was a real influence but looking back I can see that connection very clearly great well we have to wrap it up um obviously I want to thank everybody but Heather can you tell us so the, the film for Mad Men only uh it will be released soon starring James Urbaniak and Matt Walsh and featuring Mike Gold and John Ostrander um what's the release date on that again oh i don't have that in front of me oh it's okay i was that was just my way of not saying it myself oh my goodness <laughs> do we even anyway this july uh the movie will be out like i said featuring everyone here um and uh available on apple plus and uh oh, other formats um july 27th i'm being told great my sources fantastic um, on itunes and google play and everywhere you consume your media okay. um, well thank you matt walsh thank you james urbaniak uh mike gold and john ostrander co uh, comic book legends and of course filmmaker director heather ross um thanks everybody this has been super fun thanks thank you guys thank you bye thank you. bye